بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهدي ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا فمن يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله ثم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته It is um, a great privilege and a great honor as always to spend these Tuesday evenings in such a noble pursuit um, Someone once came to Imam Malik ibn Anas and they asked him what is the most beneficial thing that one can learn and Imam Malik responded, the most beneficial knowledge is the knowledge that takes you from one end of the day to the other end of the day, right? Not thinking about knowledge as, um, you know, an independent source of endeavor. Like some people, mashallah, uh, they fetishize knowledge. You know, we just want to learn and we love to converse about knowledge and Knowledge ends up becoming a kind of trivia. And have you heard this one? Oh, I heard that one before. No, Imam Malik said the best knowledge is the knowledge that you can practically implement. The knowledge that will really benefit you in your relationship with God. And so in this book, he's addressing an advanced student. So anyone who listens to the Arabic or listens to the English and notices the mubashir, the very straightforward way that the Imam is speaking, this is not because um, he is incapable of making things complicated or complex. This is because after all of that learning, after all of that memorization, after all of that reading, now I am going to attempt to give you digestible chunks of knowledge that you should put into practice what is being taught here. The Imam begins, well, you have to know the previous chapter was about a hadith uh, of the Prophet والسلام, in which the Prophet وسلم, said, the Prophet والسلام, he said, work for your livelihood in accordance with how long you plan on residing here. Work for your livelihood in accordance with how long you plan on being alive. And he said, alayhi wasalam, and work for your next life. Work for your hereafter according to how long you plan on being there. Right? And he said, and work for God in accordance with how much you need God and work to avoid punishment in the next life according to how much you can endure of the punishment of the fire. Imam Ghazali continues, إِذَا عَمِلْتَ بِهَذَا الْحَدِيثِ لَا حَاجَتَكَ لَكَ لَا حَاجَتَ لَكَ إِلَى الْعِلْمِ الْكَثِيرِ وَتَأَمَّلْ فِي حِكَايَةٍ أُخْرَى Imam Ghazali says, if you act according to this hadith, then you don't need a lot of knowledge, right? The previous hadith, uh, a shaykh named Shibli, عن, he said, I studied with 400 masters of this tradition, and I studied at least 4,000 separate prophetic statements. And the previous statement that I just read, he said that if I were to choose one statement to live my life according to it, it would be that statement. So Imam Ghazali says, if you act according to that hadith, then you don't need 
a lot of knowledge. You know, the Prophet wasallam he said in an authentic hadith, knowledge that is not acted by, meaning knowledge that you don't act according to its dictates is like a treasure, not a cent of which is spent in the way of God. It's not about what you know. It's about your ability to act according to what you know. You know, sometimes I think about everything I've read. I think about everything I've heard. Everything that I've learned, if I could act according to a tenth of what I know, I know that my state would be different. I know that I would be a better Muslim. I know that I would be a better husband. I would be a better father. I would be a better friend. I would be a better neighbor. <clears throat> a better neighbor. It's not that I need to learn more about how to be. It's that I need to implement more what I've already learned. Right, subhanAllah, um, you know, um, la ilaha illallah, I had something right on the tip of my tongue that I was about to say about acting according to what we know. When they talk about men and women of direct knowledge of Allah, men and women of ma'arifa billah or irfan billah, the best definition of what I've heard, these are people that acted according to what they knew so God taught them what they didn't know. You see, if you act according to what you know, this becomes a gateway to God giving you knowledge of things you do not know. Because if you're not acting according to what you know, then what the knowledge you already possess, it's not benefiting you. It's not serving you. You know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Everything that you learn from the Quran, he said, Al Quran laka alayk. The Quran will either be a proof for you or it will be a proof against you. Meaning, when you read Quran, when you memorize Quran, when you study Quran, it will either be something that testifies to your virtue, the virtues encapsulated in this book. She lived according to them. The virtues encapsulated in this scripture, he lived by them. Or it will be a proof against you. She used to read these verses. He used to read these verses. He memorized these verses. But he never, he never acted according to their dictates. So Imam Ghazali says, if you act according to the, that hadith that we read at the beginning, you don't need a lot of knowledge. Right? You don't need a lot of knowledge. He says, And think about the, uh, another story. He said, now contemplate another story. The story of Hatim al-Asam. He was a companion of Shaqiq al-Balkhi. These are knowers of God. One day Shaqiq asked him, you have kept my company for 30 years. What have you taken away from these years? And sometimes this is a very harsh way to think about our friends, but I want you to think about this as being two-sided. There are some people from whom you benefit and there are some people that benefit from you. So this isn't a time for you to evaluate your friends, evaluate your classmates on this um, uh, very strict basis of benefit. Like, I don't benefit from this person. Maybe that person benefits from you, right? They say every time you spend um, more than a few minutes in somebody's company, one of your states is being transferred to the other. Either you are giving them some of your positive outlook, you are giving them some of your devotion, you are giving them some of your love of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or they're giving the same to you. And the opposite is also true. 
Either a person is giving you their impoverished spiritual outlook, they are giving you their depraved state, or you're giving it to them. And that's why when I asked one of my teachers about hanging out with old friends, because I embraced Islam, mashallah, at the age of about 16 or 17. And I would often go back to my old neighborhood. And of course, I wanted all of my friends to embrace Islam. And I would hang out with them and I would talk with them. And almost inevitably, after about 15 minutes, I would find myself cursing. Right? Any other time, I would try to avoid cursing. 15 minutes with the, the homies from the old spot, I'm cursing again. Next thing you know, I'm laughing at jokes that I probably shouldn't laugh at. Next thing you know, I'm right back. I'm, I'm right back on the same corner having the same conversation. And my teachers would tell me, this means you're not strong enough because they're actually what? They're giving you da'wah. You see, they're, they're transferring their state to you. When you're ready for that encounter, you will be translating, you will be transferring your state to them. They will find that, man, you know, when I'm in his presence, I feel, I feel the need to elevate my language a little bit. Some of the things I might talk about with some of the other guys, I might avoid when I'm talking to Will. Some of the things that, right, this means that what? You're, you're communicating something. You're conveying something of how you are. So here, the teacher asked the student, you've been my student for 30 years. What have you, what have you taken from those 30 years? And I'll tell you about good teachers. Good teachers, you can learn from their silence just like you learn from their speech. You can learn by observing them just like you can learn by listening to them. There's a teacher here in Chicago. I would encourage you to meet him. And if anybody comes to the door of the masjid, he will let you in and attempt to engage you in conversation. His name is Sheikh Muhammad Imam, older Egyptian. And when I returned from Yemen, I was studying Arabic and I used to go and read Arabic poetry with Sheikh Muhammad three days a week for about two hours. And Sheikh Muhammad was an old school Azhari, min ayam al Azhar, from the days of Azhar, he was Shafi'i in his fiqh. And almost every day during Salat al-Fajr, let's go, let's go now. Every day for Salat al-Fajr, he would make dua kunut. He would make kunut in Fajr. And there was a brother who said, and this brother was new to Islam, but very energetic, very enthusiastic. He said, Sheikh Muhammad, Making dua al qunut in a time other than a time of like jihad or drought or something like this, this is a bid'ah. And Sheikh Muhammad said, I'm doing bid'ah? He said, this is a bid'ah. This is a blameworthy innovation in the religion. You've entered something into this religion. And Sheikh Muhammad said, Jazakallah khair. <laughs> now, Sheikh Muhammad is, mashallah, an imam. He said, May, may God reward you. You know what? You spent about five minutes with me today at the masjid, and you've noticed something deficient in my practice of Islam. Do you think you can come back tomorrow and spend the whole day with me and show me other places that I'm deficient in my Islam? And the brother said, yeah, I'll come back tomorrow. He said, but my day, it starts at about 2.45, 3 o'clock. Sheikh Muhammad lives in the masjid. He does not have a home. His family is in Alexandria. He lives in the masjid nine months out of the year, teaches there, goes back and spends three months with his family. All he does is pray, teach in the masjid. That's where he lives. He said, but you're gonna have to come at about a quarter to three. That's when I, that's when I start my awrah. That's when I start my dhikr. The brother said, I'll be here. So he came, 245, Sheikh Muhammad let him in. Sheikh Muhammad sat remembering Allah. Then he rose, he started praying to Hajjit before Fajr. Then he opened the door to the masjid. People started coming in to pray Fajr. 
Then after Fajr, he taught a short dars, right, in Arabic. And he sat for a while, then he made Salat al-Duha. Then after that, people just started coming to the masjid asking him all kinds of questions. Questions about this, questions about that. He had to run a few errands, do some things. This brother was accompanying him the whole way through. Then he got back to the masjid for Dhuhr. Then he made Dhuhr, then he took a nap. Qaylula, he took a nap. Then he woke up, he had some students come. He taught them maybe Fath al-Bari and another book. Then he prayed Asr. Then he sat in the masjid answering questions, calling people overseas, calling his family in Alexandria. Then he prayed Maghrib. Then he made the, the sunnah after Maghrib. Then he sat in the masjid, he taught a class of the community. Then he prayed Isha. Then after Isha, he answered some more questions. He sat for a minute, then he prayed with her. And then he asked her brother, what else did you see? What else did you see in my day? I need more help purging my practice of deen from bid'ah. And that brother who was an avowed Salafi, he said, I have never seen anybody who practices more of the sunnah than this man. Talking about Sheikh Muhammad. And I remember saying, what did he say to you? He didn't say anything to me. He just let me see his life. A teacher that you can learn from their silence like you learn from their speech. This is what you want. MashaAllah, as a community, we are a very verbose community. We are a loquacious community. And if somebody uses a word like verbose or loquacious, they are verbose and loquacious. No, I'm just kidding. Right? We're talkative people. We love to talk. We love to debate. We put out two-hour videos denouncing this scholar and that scholar. And I want to know, what do people take from your hal? What do people take from your state? And you don't have to be someone with an advanced degree from an Islamic institution to have a state that people learn from. Man, I sat in the company of this woman. I sat in the company of this man. And I just felt what it was like to really care about people. I felt what it was really like to worship Allah, to fear Allah, to love Allah. They didn't even say anything. This is what you want in your teachers. This is what you want in your friends. He continued. Qala hasaltu thamanay fawaida min al-ilm wa hiya takthini minhu li anni arju khalasi wa najati fiha faqala shaqeeq ma hiya qala hatim So he said, what have you taken away from these 30 years? He said, I have learned eight lessons from you. They suffice me. For in them are my deliverance and salvation. Shaqeen asked, what are they? Hatim said, al-fa'idatul ula inni nadharatu ila al-khalq fara'aytu li kullin minhum mahbuban wa ma'ashuqan he said, the first lesson, I have looked at people and I have found that everyone has a beloved and an object of passion which they love and long for. You know, this is something I scarcely hear people talk about, but this is one of the most Definitive ways to know a person. Just look at what they love. If you want to know deep, intimate details about a person's character, just look at what they love. This will tell you everything that you need to know about them. In fact, in some regard, we are defined by the things that we love. We're defined by what we love. He said, Haltim said, I looked at creation and I found everybody has something that they love. Something that, and he says, mahboob wa ma'ashuk. Mahboob means to love something, ishq. Ma'ashuk means to like adore something. 
right? There's a group of nasheed singers called Asha'i Rasul, those that deeply adore and love the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So your ma'ashuk is the thing that you deeply adore. And when we think about the things we love, the only thing you need to observe, what is the thing that you are unwilling to compromise? That's what you love. What is the thing that can end a discussion? Like for some people, they love their livelihood. And it's clear that they love their livelihood. Because if they're debating with someone about like priorities, we need to do this, we need to do that. Once, once they say, it's for my job, that's the end of it. It's like, well, that certainly can't be compromised, right? Some people love their families, right? It's that, it's almost like, why did you do this or that? We have to make this happen. We have to make that happen. No, no, no. This is significant to my family, meaning I'm unwilling to compromise that. Right? This is for my family. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't do it, right? You know, a friend of mine said that he was a first year associate at you know, a very prestigious law firm here in Chicago. And in his first year, he was working like 75 hour weeks, sleeping under his desk. This is old school stuff. You can't even do this stuff to people anymore. And he said that, um, his child, his first child, had some milestone, like took their first steps or I forget what the milestone was, but he complained to one of the partners, like, I miss this. And the partner looked at him and said, matter of factly, I missed three of my children's births, but now I make seven figures. Like, <laughs> yeah, it happens. He loves his livelihood. He loves his job. Miss my children's births? It can happen. It can happen. But these seven numbers, this is what it's all about. These were the sacrifices that made, uh, you know, you know well, well, this is the reward that made those sacrifices worth it. You see? He continued. وَبَعْضُ ذَلِكْ وَبَعْضُ ذَلِكْ الْمَحْبُوبِ يُصَاحِبُهُ إِلَى الْمَرْضِ الْمَوْتِ وَبَعْضُهُ يُصَاحِبُهُ إِلَى شَفِيرِ الْقَبْرِ ثُمَّ يَرْجِعُ كُلُّهُ وَيَتْرُكُهُ فَرِيدًا He said, and for all the things that people loved, some of their beloved, some of their beloveds kept their company until their final illness, while others keep their company until they reach the edge of the grave. Then everyone returns whence they came and leaves him alone and lonely. So he said, for everything that you love, even if it's a person, there's only a certain limit to which you will be able to accompany that person. I don't care how, like you love this thing. And he said, the best of the things we love, maybe those things will stay with us until our feeble old age. Like maybe a husband and wife will be together until, you know, right? In sickness and in health, right? Till death do us part. And he said, some things we love will be there with us all the way until the edge of our grave. But then after that, we will inevitably be left lonely and alone. You know, some of the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum jami'an, May God be pleased with them. They had actually dug their graves and they would lie down in those graves from time to time. Not because of some morbid fascination with death, but to remind themselves 
of the impending loneliness of death. Yes, sir. No, no, this was just like a, a spiritual exercise. This wasn't something that, you know, they didn't stay there until they died. They would just, they would just feel what that was like. And it's amazing, man. Visiting the graves is something that sobers us. The Prophet ﷺ, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said what? Alhaakumu takatur hatta zurutum al maqabir. Wealth and rivalry in wealth distracts people. Hatta zurutum al maqabir until they come to the graves, right? All of this stuff that we're deeply invested in. These are WMDs, weapons of mass distraction. You're distracted by this stuff. You're completely consumed by this stuff. Until you arrive to the graves, right? So here, Haltim is saying, look at what you love. Look at what you adore and look at how far it can accompany you. Look at how far it can go with you and recognize a lot of what we love, we cannot take with us. Even our, like when I say that, it's very easy for the mind to go to material things like clothes and cars and jewelry and homes. Yes, those kinds of cars too, right? Uh, clothes and cars and jewelry and homes and vacations and, but also relationships. You know, when each of us goes into our graves, we're going alone. And no one is going to be able to answer the as'ilat al-qabr, the questions of the grave for you. Right? When they say, Man Rabbuk, who is your Lord? I don't care how dear your teacher is to you. He cannot somehow teleport to that place and say, Allah. You will have to be able to say it. Right? Ma when they say, what is what is your deen? What is your faith? Nobody can answer those questions for you. You know, one of the um, misfortunes of these cults of personality that develop in the Muslim community is people attempt to live vicariously through these religious leaders. And yes, we love our teachers. These are brothers and sisters that have dedicated their lives to studying Islam, teaching Islam, but they can't, they can't take your account for you. They can't, they can't answer the questions of the grave for you. They can't do good deeds for you. You know, I told you guys a couple of weeks ago how, you know, we would sit in Yemen when I was in Hadramaut. And it would be like the silliest thing, but it would also be a little bit entertaining. You know what I'm saying? We would stay up at night and people would be talking about their mashaykh and they would be talking about karamat different miraculous things that they've seen from their teachers. And one person would say, my teacher flew over the masjid. They say, subhanAllah. And somebody else would say, my teacher was visiting Indonesia and a lion broke out of a zoo and everybody ran. And my teacher said, Bismillah, and grabbed the lion by the ear and just walked him back in his cage. These are stories that I really heard, yes. Right? Somebody would say, my teacher was once standing at the cover of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he was in my house at the same time. And he asked me right there, "What do you want to say to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam?" And I told him, and then he delivered the message. Everybody said, "Whoa!" And as we were doing this, a teacher walked out, and he said. Stop telling so many stories and let your stories tell you. These people that you're telling these fanciful stories about, 
I guarantee you, they didn't become whatever they are because they sat up at night telling stories. They became what they are because they prayed at night, because they remembered God at night, because they served people during the day, because they learned and they practiced what they learned. Knock it off. And he said, this is an obsession of Western Muslims and Eastern Muslims, these cults of personality. Are you a part of the inner circle of so-and-so? What is that going to do? When you go into your grave, you're going to be alone. So benefit from their company. Benefit from her teaching. Benefit from his example. But know that you must benefit individually. It's not going to be that I am going to be delivered because of my association with this person. Hey, I was wretched. I didn't practice anything I knew, but I'm friends with this guy. Only the love of the Prophet وسلم, has the ability to elevate us in that way. And, and, and by the way, I'm hoping that what I'm saying this evening can be taken with some rhetorical license. It is totally fine to love the people that you love the people that inspire your faith. It is totally fine. It's, there's nothing wrong with that, right? And to, to, to derive inspiration from their, their stories and their lived examples, but you must derive that inspiration. It's not enough just to talk about how great they were. And if you need some Quranic proof, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about Bani Israel. And he, was, he says what? Tilka ummatun qad khalat. Allah talks about the children of Israel and he says what? This is an ummah that has passed, right? This is, a, this is an ummah of the past. The great stories of these great men and women of faith, when you're listening to stories of Maryam, her iman, Asiya, her iman, you're listening to stories of Nuh and Suleiman and Dawood. Tilka ummatun qad khalat. This is the community, their time has come and gone. Lahum ma kasabu wa lakum ma kasabatum. They will have what they earned and you will have what you earn. Right? I think that this is one of the greatest fitting of uh, the contemporary Muslim community is this Islamic uh, kind of like frozen history triumphalism where we talk about the great glories of the golden ages of Islam. MashaAllah, but what about you? We know what they were. We know what they did. We know what they built. What about you? What are you? What are you going to build? What will people say about you? What will be your glory? So, mashallah, this is a, this is a very, very uh, good lesson. He continues, he said, none of them, none of these beloveds will enter the grave with them. So I reflected and I said, the best beloved a man or woman has is that which enters the grave with him or her and offers him or her some solace therein. I found this to be none other than pious deeds. 
A'mal al-salihat. So I took them as my beloved, that they might be a lap for me in my grave, offering me solace therein and not leaving me alone. So he took as his beloved, his a'mal al-salihat, his good deeds. So for Hatim, if there was one thing that could not be compromised, it would be his ability to worship Allah. His ability to worship Allah. His ability to do good deeds, he wouldn't give that up for the world. And if we knew what the world was worth and what our a'mal al-saliha were worth, we wouldn't give up our good deeds for the world. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Raka'atayi qabl al-fajr khayrun min al-dunya wa ma fiha. The Prophet Sallallahu said, the two units of prayer, the two cycles of prayer that you pray before fajr are better than this world and everything in this world. SubhanAllah. Think about that. And whenever people describe the two sunnah cycles of prayer that the Prophet ﷺ would pray before the dawn prayer, they would always say, Raka'atani khafifatani. Just very quick units of prayer. That those two cycles of prayer, better than this entire world and everything in it. You know, subhanAllah, there was a man very pious and known for his esoteric knowledge named Junaid al-Baghdadi. And Junaid, he had a majlis, kind of like this. People would sit in a circle and he would talk about the asrar, you know, the secrets, the inner meanings of things. You know, I, I guess we would term that knowledge like Deep knowledge. Like, let's get deep. Right? And he died. And somebody saw him in a dream after he died. And they said, Ya Maulana, Mada alimta min al asrar. Ya Maulana, oh our master, what have you learned from those esoteric secrets? And Junaid said, Wallahi, the only thing that benefited me was a few raka'at that we used to make in the middle of the night. That's the only thing that served as benefit for me. Not the secrets, not the esoteric knowledge, not this, uh, uh, you know, um, um, very rarefied understanding of Islam that basic, consistent devotion. This is what raised him. So when you find people like Imam al-Ghazali, people like Imam al-Jawaini, these were great scholars of Islamic legal theory and theology, saying at the end of their lives, Tubtu ila deen al-ajaiz. I've embraced the religion of old women. This is not a, you know, a frivolous statement. This is not like, you guys know I'm really sophisticated, but no. They're saying after all of that, plumbing the depths of philosophical knowledge, after all of that theology, what I really want in terms of my piety and my devotion is, is the kind of religiosity and devotional sense that we recognize in older women. Tuptu ila deen al ajaiz. That's what I want. After all, the, after all of that, Imam Ghazali just wanted to be your grandma, man. Think of, no, I'm saying this seriously. After everything he learned, after all of this knowledge, all of this theory, all of this theology, Imam Ghazali just wanted to be your grandmother. Tuptu ila deen al ajaiz. This was the statement that Imam Ghazali made on his deathbed. Ya Abu Hamid, what is your final statement? Meaning, oh Abu Hamid, 
this prolific writer, this great scholar, what is your final statement? Man, I want to die on the religion of old women. That's, what I, that's how I'm going out. That's what I want, right? With simplicity. MashaAllah. He said, he said, the second lesson that I learned, I noticed that all people follow their pleasures and hasten to the want of their egos. I thus contemplated the words of Allah, but as for him who fears to stand before his Lord and restrain his soul from undisciplined passion, verily Jannah will be his or her home. He said that he noticed that all people incline toward their egos, toward, toward the lust, toward their passions. And even though this is a pre-modern book, I think that this book has a great deal of contemporary relevance, especially in our society. Because some people would have us believe that the human being is really guided by her intellect. That is really, you know, what we think about, what we, you know, what we value from the standpoint of logic or reason or rationale. This is what becomes our pursuit. Mm -mm. Here, Halton is saying, I've noticed what people really pursue is what they want not even what they think is right, right? Anybody who's married knows what I'm talking about. How many times have you been in an argument and you're thinking, I know I'm wrong. I know I'm wrong. But something in my ego, something in my pride won't allow me to say, you're right, I'm wrong. So we will argue ad nauseum, a point that we know isn't. We, look, it's like the person is making good sense and you're thinking as they're speaking, yeah, I lost this one. I lost this one, <laughs> right? I lost this one. But do you say, you know what? I see your point. Almost none of us does that. Almost none of us does that. We will continue arguing, right? Continue arguing because something in the ego is just, you can't subdue that desire to be seen as right, right? That's why the Prophet Sallallahu he said in an authentic hadith, man kana inda qalbihi mithqalu darratan min al khibr Whoever has even an atom's weight of arrogance in their heart will not inherit the kingdom of God. There was one man who was very keen about dressing well. And when he, when he heard the prophet say this, he said, Ya Rasulullah, walakinna rajula. Or messenger of God. But a man, or by extension a woman, loves that their clothes are very nice and that their shoes are very nice. Is this arrogance? The Prophet وسلم, said, Inna Allah jameelun wa yuhibbul jamal. God is beautiful and he loves beauty. And this was the correction of, uh, you know, a very common misconception. 
Some people think that arrogance, if we see somebody taking great pride in their appearance, or we see somebody very particular about their place or thing, they're arrogant. The Prophet said, Inna Allaha Jameelun wa Yuhibbul Jamal. God is beautiful and He loves beauty. Anybody who ever wanted a hadith which underscores the importance of aesthetics, Inna Allaha Jameelun. Allah is beautiful and he loves beauty we should be a community and I'm not talking about a pretentious commitment to beauty but an actual commitment to the beautiful you know our teachers will teach us that beauty is the splendor of truth that if one is in possession of truth but there's no beauty then you have to review the truth that you possess because truth should be beautiful, right? The Prophet then said, alayhi salatu was salam, walakin al-kibr batru al-haq. Arrogance is rejecting the truth when it's presented to you. Ah. When the truth is offered to you, you don't have the humility to kneel to the truth. That's true. No, no. Something in you becomes inflated. Now, whenever we teach this hadith, Muslims in the room always think, oh, I got to pass. I'm Muslim. I haven't, I haven't rejected the truth. No, you haven't rejected the truth. But what about those other truths? When you wrong somebody and they tell you, Bro, that hurt my feelings. Do you say, I'm sorry? Or do you say, I'm sorry, you're so fragile. I'm sorry, the truth offends you. What an arrogant thing to say. I've heard people say things like that. Bro, man, that hurt my feelings, man. I'm sorry, the truth offends you. Ah, batrul haq. Hada huwa aynul kibr. Batrul haq. Why can't you just say, hey, I, I didn't intend it. I'm sorry. That's it. Sorry. I didn't mean, I didn't, I, I didn't mean anything by it. I'm sorry. With no qualifications. Right? With no qualifications. This is hard to do. This is hard to do. You know, I always joke for brothers. The other side is also hard, right? It's hard for us to admit we have feelings. Right? My wife says to me, I'm sorry I hurt your feelings. Whoa. You didn't hurt my feelings. It's just that I didn't want what you said to be displeasing to Allah. Okay? Feelings, I don't even have those. No, of course it hurts your feelings. Of course it hurts your feelings. But batrul haq, rejecting the truth when it comes to you. Right? Mm. Right? And then nas, looking down on other people. This is the arrogance that will distance us from God's mercy. Looking down on other people. Who? I'm better than him. I'm better than her. Learn what from who? What can she teach me? What can he teach me? This is arrogance. This is arrogance. He said, فَتَأَمَّلْتُ فِي قَوْلِهِ تَعَالَى فَأَمَّا مَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ وَنَهَا النَّفْسَ عَنِ الْهَوَى فَإِنَّ الْجَنَّةَ هِيَ الْمَأْوَى He said, I thought about the verse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As for the one who restrains his or her soul from the base undisciplined lust that their soul inclines toward, their reward will be paradise. Now here, it's, this, is, this, is, this is, mashallah, a beautiful ayah of the Quran, and it's also reflected, the meaning is reflected in the hadith of the Prophet, alayhi salam, al-mujahidu, 
من جاهد نفسه في طاعة الله المجاهد the one that strives for the sake of Allah من جاهد is is he or she who strives على نفسه في طاعة الله against his or her own desires to strive for something means to work hard for it one of the implications of this ayah of quran and this in this hadith uh, of the prophet والسلام, is sometimes it's a struggle man it is a struggle you know one of the narratives that i think is cheating our community out of a lot of growth is we think spirituality is supposed to be easy right we think you know when you become spiritual you become like very uh polyannish which is like always nice right always nice you're nice all the time hey Somebody just scratched my car, but I'm spiritual, so it's, it's all cool, man. You become ethereal. Ethereal is like, like a person in a different world, you know, like people from California. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I know people are watching from California. I love the great state of California. I always say, when people abroad are thinking about the American dream, they're really thinking about life in California, <laughs> right? We just think it's supposed to be, it's all good. And, you know, everywhere that I go just magically smells like Bukhur. You know, every, you know, no. Some things, it is really a struggle. It is really a struggle. It's a struggle. And that's why Imam Ghazali, and I think this is like, this isn't like sensational. But I think it's quite instructive. They were asking Imam Ghazali about spiritual striving. And they said, describe spiritual striving in just a very everyday practical uh, example. And he said, spiritual striving is when you're eating something really good. It's delicious. It's really appetizing. And you have reached a place of like, I'm full keeping your hand from grabbing more just because it tastes good. That's what spiritual striving is like. Being able to say, man, as someone who loves good food, I can tell you that's hard to do. I answered the, que I, I answered the question in the car. I'll, I will answer the question in the car, right? Sometimes you have to step up and sometimes you have to step back. So sometimes trying to exert that level of control over your passions, things that you feel very strongly about, man, it is very difficult. It's very, very difficult. So not to be... Um, Uh, unnecessarily controversial. But especially uh, during this time, right? Many people are celebrating Pride Month. I participated in some programs about this. And somebody, you know, asked the question, is it probable that God could create somebody with these desires and then make them responsible for striving against acting according to those desires? And I'm like, yes, that is, that is probable. That is possible. This is a struggle. And it would be insensitive of me to say like, oh, I can, under or it's nothing, or I understand it. I don't understand it. I don't understand it. But I do know that this is what it means to strive. It's hard sometimes, man. It's hard. You know, um, one place that um, it was um, 
something that at the time, at the time, I deemed it a great misfortune. But now that I've gotten older, I understand it to be something that taught me a lot about faith. You know, when I was younger, I had two very close family members that were addicted to drugs. And um, watching them struggle against their chemical dependencies, it was um, just an eye-opening reality because the level of vigilance and renewed commitment that this required of them on a daily basis, in fact, on a, on a momentary basis, from moment to moment, from moment to moment, right? Uh, it was just reflective of what it means to strive for the sake of Allah. Like this was never going to be easy, right? You know, um, when you talk to people that, you know, have, you know, gained their sobriety and maybe they've been so sober for 20 years and you ask them, is it, I mean, it's been two decades. Is it easy now? No. I just got done checking in with a group. I just got, I'm, I've been sober 20 years and I still make those calls every morning. Like, dang. That's the kind of vigilance that it requires. You know, Joe Walsh, who's a drummer, he summed it up for me. I was reading an interview that he did about uh, sobriety. And they said, how long have you been sober? He said, 35 years. He said, but more importantly, I haven't had a drink today. I said, subhanAllah. Meaning, all of those 35 years could have been erased if I, had, if I had had a drink this morning. That's how vigilant I have to be in striving against this desire of mine, this chemical dependent, this at one time chemical dependency of mine. So when he says, As for the one that struggles against their soul. Brothers and sisters, sometimes it is a real struggle. We might be engaged in habitual sins that man, or we might have proclivities, we might have inclinations that man, we have to monitor ourselves from hour to hour just to make it through the day. Like, yo, man, I'm just trying to get through today without backbiting. You know, one, I was listening to Sheikha Aisha Prime. Hafizahullah, may Allah preserve her. And she said that she was talking about backbiting. And somebody said, but if we didn't talk about people behind their backs, what would we do at a family gathering? I said, man, <laughs> you know, it can get that bad, right? But we might have habitual things that it's like, yo, man, we, got, we have to really strive. We have to really strive. Now, if we exert ourselves and we strive earnestly, Allah promises us a heavenly reward that is everlasting. So we talked about how implementation is more important than knowledge for a person or individual, that the basics of Islam is hard to achieve. What do those practical implementations look like? Mm. Practical implementations are the arkan al-khamsa, the five pillars of Islam. That the first thing you want is to declare God's oneness and declare the finality of prophethood 
being expressed in the person of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That's the first thing. After one does this, prayer. And prayer, man, prayer is, you know, um, for people that have grown up Muslim, they don't realize that for people converting to Islam, prayer can be a great challenge because the only prayer we knew was dua, was just, you know, appealing to God um, in a very personal way. At times, whenever I'm talking and I start sweating, I feel like a real preacher. Right. Appealing to God in a very personal way, at times and in places and in ways that you dictate, right? Where salah is preparing and performing the prayer. Preparing for and performing the prayer in a manner prescribed by God. At times prescribed by God. Right? It's, it's, it's quite different. Right? And learning to pray regularly and learning to pray well. This is always the first step to any serious engagement with spiritual cultivation. Learning to pray and learning to pray well. I actually see myself, I mean, I've been Muslim now for almost 23, 23, 24 years. And I still feel like I'm on a journey with my prayer. I'm, I'm on a journey with my prayer. You know, I mean, when I first started, brother, it felt like we had to pray 50 prayers a day. Whenever I would hang out with Muslims and they were like, are you ready to pray? I'm like, again? We just prayed. I'm like, yes. In the wintertime? Pray good. Okay, it's time for Asa. We just pray. And you know, you need to make wudu. I need to make wudu. Come on, man. Yeah, I mean, it, it, was, it, it was tough. It was tough. I mean, Salat al Fajr? Oh man, don't even, don't even, look, I know that laugh. That's a knowing laugh, right? Fajr, brother, sometimes in the winter time in Chicago, those blankets are heavier than 315 pounds of, of weights on the bench, man. You're sitting, you got those blankets, you're, you're warm and cozy under those blankets, and then the phone alarm goes off, you're like, hey, Fajr. La ilaha illallah. Right, that's tough. So learning to pray. Then fasting. Fasting, very, if you've never fasted, fasting will be very difficult. Then, and I think this is, you know, uh, underrated in terms of spiritual cultivation, giving, right? Giving, giving zakat. Giving of your wealth. You know, some people... When you talk to them about charity, they understand charity to be, you know, giving a dollar or two to a passerby. Like, you know, somebody walks by, you give them a dollar or two. At the most, you give them 10, 15 bucks. If you're really feeling it, maybe you give them a 20. Right, here you go. Right. But sitting down to think about my wealth, to add it up. And to give some to, to a person, not as, you know, uh, voluntary charity, but as their right. You have a right to this. This is your hawk. Many of us, we've never, we've never done something like that, right? And, um, you know, as someone that was young when I embraced Islam, and I didn't grow up, uh, I didn't grow up poor, but this kind of get yours mentality, it was very much a part of like the culture that I grew up in. Like get, like go for yours, get yours, right? Giving was something that, you know, I hadn't really, uh, I hadn't really encountered it until I became Muslim. You know, I always say to somebody, I was at an Iman fundraiser in Detroit. Rami Nashashibi was on stage talking about Iman, fundraising. 
And the person sitting next to me wrote a check for $50,000. And, I, and I, I looked over and I saw it. And that was the most money I had ever seen somebody give away. And I said out loud, subhanAllah. Because <laughs> I had never seen a person. I remember on the way home, riding back to Chicago, the only, you know, you make dua because you're traveling. The only dua I would make is, oh Allah, give me a chance to do that. Increase me in my wealth so I can know what it feels like to give somebody $50,000. I want to know what that feels like, right? I was like, and, you know, the brother did it like it was, no, you know, just discreetly wrote it and, you know, was putting it in an envelope. I saw it. I was like, whoa, subhanAllah. He looked at me like, dude, dude come, on, come on, man. I was at one of these last week and I gave the same amount. Relax, bro. <laughs> and I was just like, yo, I've never seen this. So learning to give, learning to give. For some of us, it's very easy. But for some of us, learning, this will work on your soul. Like to give, to, to go into your account and to take money out, a significant amount, to give it to somebody else. Bismillah. Bismillah. This is for you. This is your hawk. And this will... A hypothetical you, son. No, no, no. The, the money that I give you, <laughs> a lot more than 50000 <laughs> Right? But it is for you. So just start just starting with those five pillars of Islam. You know, I think that um, one of the reasons we wanted to do this course is we wanted people to see the profound inside the simple. That a lot of these things, when people are thinking like, I'm trying to get into my spirituality, I'm trying to like get into myself, you know, we go all the way to like letter Z. No, start, start with your ABCs making your prayers, fasting, right? Giving of your wealth, right? Making hajj, starting, like, starting there. Like, starting there, right? Learning to do those things and learning to do those things well, the beginning of your spiritual development. You know, in our tradition, this is called fard ayn. Your fard ayn. Your individual responsibilities. And there's more details in them than a lot of people realize. And that if you just say, you know what? My five pillars of Islam. I just want to sit with somebody who can teach me about those five things, right? Teach me about, you know, my shahada, which is like just a base. We're not talking about an exhaustive aqidah. No, just study your shahada, the conditions of your shahada, what nullifies your shahada? Start focusing on your prayer. Focus on your fasting. Focus on giving charity. Focus on making hajj. And I guarantee you will be a changed person. And Allah knows best. Um, you're talking about arrogance. And I just, I, I've heard that like, if you're arrogant about a certain thing over another person, like, oh, uh, I could never do that sin or that's something that's so disgusting or like I could never do something like that. I've heard that like later on that's something it's like a guarantee almost that you are going to be fall into that sin. Mm. And I don't know if that's just like a, a saying or if there's like something concrete in the tradition. Yeah, I, I know this as a saying. I don't know this as a prophetic tradition. But the, um, the asal, the basic root there is certainly true. You know, um, you know, they say never say never, right? And um, I find it a great act of hypocrisy that whenever one of us does something wrong, we want the people evaluating us to think about that wrong action as an anomaly. Like, it, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's not the best expression of what I am. And we start looking at what they call the haithiyat. We look at like all of the circumstances. Well, you know, I was tired. Uh, you know, if I, I yelled at somebody in traffic, 
I was tired. My air conditioning wasn't working. It was 103 degrees. Um, I had just had an argument with a friend. I, we have all of these ways of explaining how this did not come from my essence. This was just a mistake that I fell into. But then Ibn Al-Ta'ila, he says, when somebody does something wrong to you, you never give them those excuses. You never, you look at it like this was an essential expression of what they are. You never look at all of the circumstances, all of the situations, all of the different, you know, you don't contextualize their wrongdoing, but you want everybody to contextualize your wrongdoing, right? We have all kinds of excuses. Oh, well, you know, it, it just, you know, I know it seemed like I did that, but I was thinking, see, this is what you do for yourself. When someone else asks of the same thing of us, no, 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 no. It's like, no, offer people some of the consideration that you want, right? The Prophet, alayhi sallallahu wa sallam, First hadith of the Sumbuliya, great collection of hadith that we studied at Azhar. Irham men fil ard, yarham kum men fil sama. Have mercy on the people on earth and the one above the heavens will have mercy on you. So where does your mercy come from? Udr, making excuses for people. It doesn't mean you deny their wrong, but you try to find some way of explaining their wrong other than She's just a rotten person. He's just a wretched man. Nah, you know, you know, even people that have really wronged me, you know, doesn't mean that I want to be their friend again. Doesn't mean that I've forgotten, right? But I try to understand. So like, you know, I had a tough time with my grandfather growing up when I lived with him. As I got older, you know, after he passed, I said, you know, if I had seen half of what he did growing up, who knows how I would be, man? Right? Who knows how I would be? So, right? Well, in this, I, I've mentioned this statement many times, but I think it's such an important statement in our community. That as you get older, you will inevitably be disappointed by more people. You will inevitably be let down and hurt by more people. And if Allah blesses you, you will still be able to see them through a prism of mercy. And it doesn't mean that you forgive, like you, you know, for, for big things, it's not like you should forgive tomorrow. That's not what I'm saying. It's a process. But ultimately, you're forgiving for yourself and not for them. It's a process. It's a process. But you want to try to see people through a prism of mercy. Like, you know, somebody stole from me. Somebody that I knew. And I was angry, and I probably won't ever let them in my home again. But, but, I have to think to myself, dang, what did they experience as a child or as an adult that would make them feel that this was the best way to go about securing what they needed? Because I wouldn't expect that my children would even think, you know what, I want this, he has it, I'll steal it. And so then you begin to feel not sorry, but some empathy. Man, what, dang. What have you gone through that you would think this is the best way to get what you need is to steal it from people? SubhanAllah. Right? You know, so instead of looking down on people, try to empathize, man. Does it, and every time I talk like this, there's at least one person like, what about justice? We're not, you know, people still have to be held accountable for what they do. I'm talking about how you regard what they do. Right? You can hold a person accountable while still empathizing with them, hmm. right? The, the, the two are not mutually exclusive. I, I really hate that about the way these issues are discussed in popular culture. You're either empathetic or, uh, you know, holding people accountable. 
Can we do both? Yes, there's a punishment for that, right? There's a punishment for that. But I feel, I feel for you, man, right? I feel for you, right? I feel for you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Wa la'asr inna l'insana lafi khusr illa ladina aminu wa amilu salihati wa tawasib al-haqi wa tawasib al-sabr. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wassalamun ala al-mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.